I begin in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. I bear witness that there's none worthy of worship except the one Allah and that his beloved Nabi and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his last and final messenger. As we embark on these really powerful, mubarak, blessed days and nights of the month of Dhul Hijjah, in which we commemorate the teachings and the practices of the prophets Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as salatu was salam and Hajrah radiyallahu anha as taught to us by our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, a'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, wal fajr wa layalin ashra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath and says, by the dawn and the ten nights. According to the majority of the commentators of the Quran, these 10 nights refer to the 10 nights, the first 10 nights of the month of Dhul Hijjah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran and he says, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَىٰ كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ He says, announce to the people the obligation of Hajj so that they would come to you on foot, on every lean camel, traveling through every distant hilly pathway. This also, as we all know, happens to be the season of Hajj. Hundreds of thousands and millions of people from around the world will be going to Mecca, will be performing their Hajj, Mina, Arafat, Muzdalifa, back to Mina, visiting the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the city of Medina and will be fulfilling this once in a lifetime obligation for many their first time there and for so many maybe even their last time there. So a moment of excitement, a moment of worship, a moment of servitude, a moment of gratitude, a moment of, of satisfaction where they feel that they've been honored to having fulfilled this obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But naturally, that's not the case with everyone. The vast majority of the, of the ummah, the vast majority of the community, they're going to be at home and we're going to be spending, beginning this month, going through the course of this month, fulfilling all these other acts of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which reminds me of a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma narrates where he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ فِيهَا أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَيَّامِ يَعْنِي أَيَّامَ الْعَشْرِ the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, there's no virtue more to the liking of Allah in any day other than these days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes the ibadah and worship, the ibadah and worship, the servitude of these days, the first 10 days and nights of the month of Dhul Hijjah are more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than any other days. So while as Muslims, we think generally of the month of Ramadan, of a time of worship and ibadah and servitude and of generosity and charity, these 10 days and nights are also included to be a part of that. So as the month of Dhul Hijjah begins, right, we should be on high alert. We should be in that same and similar mode as we usually are at the beginning of the month of Ramadan because these are extremely beloved nights. The Sahaba, the hadith continues very briefly. The Sahaba asked and said, O oh Messenger of Allah, not even struggle in the path of Allah, because struggling in the path of Allah is, is extremely rewarding, has a great reward, great merit attached to it. And the Prophet responded and said, Wal al jihadu fi sabilillah, not even struggle in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except for an individual who may leave with his or her wealth and life and not be able to return with either. Which reminds me of another hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Hurairah Radiallahu Anhu narrates, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says something similar. مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنْ يُتَعَبَّدَ لَهُ فِيهَا مِنْ عَشْرِ ذِي الْحِجَّةِ يَعْدِلُ صِيَامُ كُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِنْهَا بِصِيَامِ سَنَةٍ وَقِيَامُ كُلِّ لَيْلَةٍ مِنْهَا بِقِيَامِ لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam says, there's no days more beloved to Allah that He be worshipped in them 
than the 10 days of the month of Dhul Hijjah. Here's the part that we want to remind ourselves. He says, alayhi salatu wasalam, peace and blessings of God be upon him. Fasting every day of them is the equivalent of fasting for an entire year. And standing every night of them in prayer is the equivalent of standing the night of Qadr. Like I said earlier, generally, we only think of these merits attached to the fasting and the prayer of the month of Ramadan and the days and nights of Dhul Hijjah. While we know they're extremely meritorious, we sometimes do not utilize them the way they should. And so that's something to keep in mind. And so moving on to fasting, if we may, there's three ahadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wasallama, that I want to share. One of them says that the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasallam, yasumu tis'a dhil hijjah. The Prophet ﷺ used to fast the first nine days of the month of Dhul Hijjah. So the Sunnah would be to fast all nine days. And then in another narration, it's been mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ says, Siyamu Yawmi Arafah. This is a really famous hadith. For anyone who fasts on the day of Arafah, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. The ninth of Dhul Hijjah, wherever we may be in any part of the world, the Prophet ﷺ says, I anticipate that Allah, God would forgive the year after it and the year before it. So these are extremely meritorious. So wherever we may be, whichever state, country we may be in, uh, know when the month of Dhul Hijjah begins, begin fasting if we can, not a requirement, a sunnah of the beloved alayhi salatu wasalam. But as the ninth of Dhul Hijjah comes, the day of Arafah, the day, uh, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, wherever you may be, the day before Eid, fast on that day. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give us this extremely great reward for individuals who may not be able to fast for, for whatever reason, at least intend in your hearts that if I was able to, I would have fasted. And inshallah, our reward would be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Though I, I do want to share one thing. There's another hadith, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet alayhi salam said, Naha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama an sawmi yawmi arafata bi arafata. That for those individuals who happen to be in arafah, at Hajj, the Prophet prohibited them uh, from fasting. Also, a few other things that we can do during this time. It's a time of prayer and dua. The Prophet والسلام, says, Khayru dua, dua yawm Arafah. The best dua is the dua of the day of Arafah. Naturally, we know that for those individuals who happen to be in Hajj, on the day of Arafah, we're fulfilling one of the obligations of Hajj. And so it is a day of prayer and supplication. But inshallah, it also happens to be a day of prayer and supplication for everyone else, wherever we may be. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, continues. He says, the best of what I have said and the Prophets before me have said on this day is, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahul mulku wa lahul hamd, wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadeer. So I'm just going to take a moment to remind myself and everyone else to make it a point that as we approach the month of Dhul Hijjah, we make sure that we value it. As we approach the day of Arafah, make sure that we value it the way it's supposed to be done so. Go out of our way and pray a little. Think of all the beautiful lessons that we learn from the story of Ibrahim and Ismail and Hajar radiallahu anhum, the sacrifices that they made, right? The sacrifice that each of them made and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only asks us to make some small sacrifices in our lives. And as a result of those sacrifices, God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bless them with so many blessings. And for anyone that may be going through any difficulty and any sacrifice that we happen to be making for the sake of Allah, know that there is a reward for it and there are divine openings. There's another verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْدُودَاتٍ And remember Allah during specified days. And generally we understand from that are the takbirat 
of tashriq when we say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. And in one narration, the opening takbirat, uh, three times that we say these takbirat after our fard prayers. These are known as takbirat of tashriq in the Shafi'i and the Hanbali madhab, their sunnah, in the Hanafi madhab, it's wajib and in the Maliki madhab, it's mustahab. As far as according to Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, it's to be done after 23 prayers from the Fajr of the 9th until the Asr of the 13th. So we actually begin the day before Eid and we say the takbirat generally only to be said once. Uh, many a times when we happen to be in a masjid or in a public place and people recite the takbirat, they do it three times. Know that as long as it's done once, uh, that wujub, that obligation will have been fulfilled. According to Imam Malik, it's only 20 prayers from the dhuhr of the day of Eid until the Fajr of the 13th. And Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi has distributed it. He said uh, there's a specific number for the Hajis and the non-Hajis. As far as the non-Hajis, they will do it for 24 prayers. And instead of, instead of ending on the Asr of the 13th, ending after Maghrib on the 13th. And for the Hajis from the Dhuhr of the day of Eid uh, for three days, 15 prayers. Lastly, there's another act of immense act of worship that we do uh, during these days around Eid al-Adha is our sacrifices. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that a human does no action from the actions of the day of Nahar, from the day of Eid, more beloved to Allah than the animal sacrifice. That we will receive a full recompense for this sacrifice on the day of judgment. And so the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam in another place says that whosoever has the financial ability to make a sacrifice and does not perform that sacrifice should not come to prayer. Now he doesn't literally mean don't come to prayer. The Prophet peace be upon him sallallahu alayhi wasalam is highly encouraging us to make that sacrifice. Either we fulfill that sacrifice by having it done on our behalf in parts of the world where people happen to be in greater need. Or for example, for those of us that are living here, we may want to do a portion of the sacrifice ourselves so that we can experience it, so that our children can experience it and we can celebrate that immense important element uh, of, of Eid al-Adha you know, by ourselves and with our families. I also want to share one thing when we talk about sacrifice is that we can do it on behalf of ourselves, but we can also do it on behalf of our loved ones who may not be with us. We can also do it on behalf of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Ali radiallahu anhu narrates that, I, I, there's a narration that says, Ali radiallahu anhu would slaughter two sheep, one for the Prophet alayhi salam and one for himself. He was asked about this. He said, why do you do one for the Prophet? And he responded and said, Amarani bih. The Prophet commanded me to do this. Yani an, an Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet, peace be upon him, commanded me to do this. Fala ada'uhu abada. I will never ever leave this practice. And we've seen our pious predecessors uh, over the generations that when they would do their sacrifice, if they had the ability, they would do one on behalf of the Prophet, peace be upon him sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well. So in closing, brothers and sisters, it's a beautiful, beautiful time of year that we're about to embark on. And it is a time of ibadah, worship, as I mentioned earlier, generosity, kindness, whatever, all those qualities that make us a better person. All those qualities that we bring into ourselves, especially in the month of Ramadan, and endeavor to maintain and continue them after the month of Ramadan, we bring those into ourselves during the month of Dhul Hijjah as well. And so with that said, we 
ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make these days and nights blessed and beautiful for all of us, our families, those around us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of us with a Mubarak Eid al-Adha. For those that happen to be at Hajj, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah grant them all a Hajj al-Mabrur. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us to the sacred lands again and again and allow us to be amongst those believers who submit to him, who are pleased with their Lord, and their Lord becomes pleased with them. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullahu khayran. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.